Hey, thanks for joining us at Connection Point Church. You know, we would love for you to stay connected and a simple way for you to do that is to subscribe so that each week you can get notified when new content goes live. We'd also love to keep in touch with you throughout the week and the best way to do this is through our Connection Point Facebook page. Now with all that being said, let's go to this week's message with our lead pastor, Zach Maddox. Welcome to Connection Point and welcome to those joining us online. I'm Pastor Zach. Shelly and I serve as lead pastors here, so glad you've joined us today. As we continue what has been a two and a half year journey through the New Testament book of Luke. Hey, we're in chapter 20, so we're getting there. Uh, We're going to finish it by uh, January of next year. (laughs) So be it, it was said. So be it. Uh, You know, but it's, it's been wonderful to be able to look at the life of Christ as, as Luke records it. And what I wanted to do this morning is go back to the beginning of Luke, not to start over, don't, don't worry, <laughs> but for us to be reminded of, of what is happening as we're walking through this New Testament book. So Luke, he opens this book saying, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. So he says that there's many accounts about these events that have happened. They used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus. So Luke was compiling this this work and and the life of Jesus and the stories that he shared for a person named Theophilus. And here's why. He says, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. We're looking at the New Testament book of Luke because it is Luke's desire, it is my desire, it is the Lord's desire that we are certain of who Jesus is. That's really the question that Luke is seeking to answer. Who is Jesus. And that's really what Theophilus was asking Luke. Theophilus commissioned Luke to say, Luke, can you look into all of these things for me? Because I want to make sure that that which I am following is true. Because he needed to understand who is this man who claimed to be God? Is this true? And I want to take that a step further this morning because we've looked at messages about who is Jesus, but the question this morning I really want us to take a look at is, is Jesus your Lord? And this matters because as you look at the New Testament, it says for those that have confessed with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, you shall be granted eternal life. So we really need to understand and and be firm in our hearts of are we following Jesus as Lord or are we following him for some other reason? Who is Jesus? And who is Jesus to us? I've shared before, you know, if we believe Jesus is a genie, we simply pursue him as someone to grant our wishes. That's not who he is. We sang about that this morning. If we believe Jesus is a great teacher, we simply study his words for increased knowledge. Jesus is not just a great teacher. If we believe Jesus is our therapist, we seek him to help us cope with life's problems and and tell us how special we are. So our view of Jesus matters because our view of Jesus determines the way that we live our lives and how we approach him. So I really want us to understand who Jesus is this morning. We need to understand who he is because it determines what it means for us to be a follower of his. So if you have your Bibles, hey, I hope you've got God's Word with you today. If you're new to Connection Point, we say that because we want you daily in God's Word. If you don't have a Bible with you today, there's one underneath the chair in front of you. You're welcome to borrow that. If you don't have one at home, take it home as a gift from the church. We want you to have access to God's Word. But we're going to be in Luke chapter 20. This may be the shortest passage I've read to date. We're going to be in verse 41, just going to verse 44. So I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word, just simply out of reverence for the fact that God gave His Word to us. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 20. Starting in verse 41, Jesus is speaking to a crowd here, and here's what he says. He said to them, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? 
These are the very words of God. You may be seated this morning. You can feel like you're doing an up and down game today. So where do we leave off in Luke? We left off in Luke a couple of weeks ago, talking about the resurrection. We found that people, as they surrender their lives to God, they are children of God who are then the people of the resurrection. We should be excited about the fact that we are people of the resurrection as we choose to follow Jesus. What a hope we have of life eternal in him. So the question is then, are you only living for this life or are you living in light of eternity? Because if we're living with the understanding that we are going to live forever, it should change the way we live now. It really should. In fact, I'll say that we really can only step into the extraordinary life Jesus offers by living in light of eternity. If we're living for the here and now, we miss the abundant life that Jesus means for us to live. And your view of Jesus is ultimately what determines how you live your life. We must live in light of eternity and we must live with the right understanding of who Jesus is to live that extraordinary life. And that's why our passage today is so important. That's why we're pausing to take a look at just a few verses this morning. Because they tell us who Jesus is, and once we understand who Jesus is, we must consider how his identity informs the way we live our lives. So knowing our view of Jesus determines how we live our lives, it's important we know who Jesus is. We've got to start there. So the question is, who is Jesus? That was the ongoing question for Luke as he's walking through the book, and it's, a, it's an unfolding revelation of who Jesus is. So I want us to look at our passage and put it in the right context this morning. So we've been journeying for a while now. We got to the point in Luke chapter 9 where Jesus sets his face on Jerusalem. He's traveling toward Jerusalem, and now he's entering into Jerusalem. This is the week before he goes to the cross. And so what is he doing there? Well, he went to Jerusalem for the Passover, a Jewish festival that celebrated Israel's exodus from Egypt. He was greeted by a crowd waving palm branches as he came over the Mount of Olives. He was riding on a donkey. People were yelling, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And then Jesus, as he's now coming down the Mount of Olives, he looks on Jerusalem and he weeps because it is a joy that Jesus is coming for those who know him, but it is a tragedy for those who do not. And this is how it is to live as a follower of Christ. There's both rejoicing because we have Jesus, and that should make all the difference in our lives. But there's also this lament because not everybody does. But of course, we're meant to do something about that. So Jesus enters Jerusalem, and he goes to the temple courts. He gets upset with what he sees there because the temple leadership has restricted access to God for foreigners. And so Jesus gets upset. He flips over money changers' tables and he takes over the temple compound. And so the religious leaders, they come and ask Jesus, well, by what authority do you do this? And Jesus doesn't answer their question. He just gives them a question. But then he shares this story which shows that the temple leadership is about to be removed. And the temple authority, the the leadership that's there, they get really upset with Jesus because they understand that he's just threatened their leadership, their way of life, and they don't like it, so they want to get rid of Jesus. So what do they do? They set up ongoing opportunities to test Jesus and ask him questions about taxes and resurrection, and, and it seems they really can't ask any question that he can't answer. But now he flips the table and he says, now I've got a question for you. Let me help lead you on a a journey. What does he ask? He says, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? The word Christ in the New Testament is a New Testament translation for the word Messiah. That's all that Christ means. And so what Jesus is confirming is, I know that people say the Messiah is David's son. Everybody understood that in the first century. And this is why Matthew considered it so important. Because in order to be the Messiah, you had to come from the lineage of David. So what does Matthew do in his New Testament books? There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We call those the Gospels. And Matthew, what he opens with, he says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, who? The son of David. He wanted everyone to understand Jesus came from the lineage of David. Because in order to be the Messiah, he had to. 
And people in the crowd, they knew others up to this point had already referred to Jesus in this way. So Jesus, as he sets his face on Jerusalem, he's going through Jericho. This is before he gets to this week. And he encounters a blind beggar. And here's what we find recorded in Mark. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, who? He refers to him through that messianic line of people. He called out Jesus as the son of David. This blind beggar had spiritual insight to know who Jesus was. But now as he's coming into Jerusalem, after he's interacted with blind Bartimaeus, the crowd calls out to him. And what do they say to him? Hosanna to who? The son of David. Again, so people have already recognized, they know the lineage of Jesus. It was well known, the genealogical records of where people came from. They know that Jesus was from the line of David and they kept affirming this. Even non-Jews recognized Jesus was the son of David. We find in Matthew chapter 15, a Canaanite woman from that region came out crying, have mercy on me, O Lord. Who? Son of David. So as Jesus is speaking to the crowd, he's affirming, we know the Messiah is coming from the line of David. And of course, what's inferred, he said, and I know you guys understand that that's the line I come from. But let me take you a little bit further into who the Messiah is, is what Jesus is doing by asking them questions. And so what does he say? He says, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So what Jesus is doing here is he's quoting from the most popular psalm in the New Testament. It's the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. It's a messianic psalm. It's Psalm 110. It's quoted over 33 times in the New Testament. So obviously it's an important psalm. So I want to take a look at that psalm. I, I gave an instruction before. When you see an Old Testament passage in the New Testament, it's good to go back to the Old Testament passage to understand context. And so when we look at that psalm, Jesus is making a direct quote. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord says to my Lord. Anybody else ever been confused by that statement? Is he talking to himself? What's going on here, right? What helps us with the Old Testament passage that's not written down in the New is whenever they translate in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament's written in the Hebrew language. And in the Hebrew language, whenever they translated the word Yahweh, which was who God is, it's the great name, a name that Jews would not utter for fear of blasphemy. So they just would refer to Yahweh as the name because it's the most important name for God. Whenever they translate in the Old Testament, Yahweh, in your Old Testament passages, so this is some Bible knowledge for you, it's translated capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. So when it's Lord in all caps, it's referring to Yahweh. But then what happens when it's Lord with just a capital L? That's the Old Testament word for Adonai. And the interesting thing about Adonai is it can refer to God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. Context tells us what it means. And because this is a messianic psalm, this is really best translated as God said to the Son. This is what Jesus is quoting here. God said to the son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus quotes this verse and then he asks, David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And what Jesus is doing is he's leading the crowd. He's helping them understand there's something going on with the Messiah that you all have missed up to this point. I know you recognize the Messiah will come from the lineage of David, and I know that you're aware that I come from the lineage of David, but I also want to take you into a deeper understanding of who the Messiah is. Jesus is leading them today. They've been asking by whose authority do you do these things, and he's about to give them the answer. He says, you see the Messiah, yes, he's from the line of David, but guess what? He's also divine. He's the son of God. And we take that information for granted today. If you have any church background at all, we've always known Jesus is the son of God. We've known the Messiah is the son of God. But for those, that crowd that's there that day, they didn't understand that. They just thought this was going to be an earthly king. And what Jesus says, no, 
This is a God king. And my rule is for the entire world, not just to set up a nation, but to set up a kingdom. God's everlasting kingdom. Jesus in this section of scripture has revealed to the crowd who he is and by what authority he does these things. Jesus has finally been revealed. People should know who he is. Their minds are being awakened to the fact that not only is this man from the line of David, but he's the son of God. He is divine. And that should change everything. In fact, it's this designation that eventually sends Jesus to the cross. Take a look at Matthew chapter 26. He says, the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. So this is the trial of Jesus. They want to crucify him. So they're trying to find a way to do that. So the the high priest, he says to him, tell us if you are the Messiah. What did he now add to it? The son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so that what you have said is what he's saying is true. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. This is what sends Jesus to the cross as he affirms his identity as the Son of David, the Son of Man, the Son of God. Jesus is Lord. So the question is, who is Jesus? Jesus is Lord. And his identity should impact the way that we live. So what does it mean, though, that Jesus is Lord? Let's keep unpacking those things. What does it mean that Jesus is Lord? The psalm that Jesus quotes, Psalm 110, it points out that Adonai, the son, will be seated at the right hand of God. But what does that mean? What does it mean that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God? It's always best to let Scripture interpret Scripture. So we look at Psalm 89, and here's the description we have. You have a mighty arm, strong is your hand, high your right hand. As you look through the Old Testament over and over, what you find, the right-hand designation is a place of power and strength. And then the New Testament writers, they, they pick this up. Paul then writes, he says, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come and put everything under his feet. Jesus as Lord is seated at the right hand of God. Far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. Jesus is mighty. He is powerful. And in case you're unaware, he is active in your life. Take a look at Romans chapter 8. I love Romans chapter 8. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is where? At the right hand of God. There it is again. And what's he doing? Interceding for you. Jesus as our mighty, powerful intercessor. He's interceding for you right now. Do we ever stop and think about that? Every day, everywhere that you go, Jesus is your intercessor. He's with you. Jesus as Lord should make a difference in our life because he's with us. He intercedes for you when you go to places like Walmart. And sometimes we need it. I could think of all kinds of places he's interceding for us as we go. (laughs) I'm sure you could too. May we stop and sometimes think about that in days where we're having struggles to know that Jesus is right there with us. And he's not there as some weak individual. He's there at the right hand of God, powerful and mighty over all dominion and authority. That's who is with you. So my encouragement would be, let's start walking in that kind of confidence. You don't need self-confidence in your life. You need God confidence in your life. May you have God confidence each and every day that you live. Because if it's just self-confidence, some, at some point you'll realize you aren't enough. But thank God he's interceding for us and he is enough. May we walk with God confidence each and every day. Jesus, our Lord, who has all authority and power, he's with us. And if Jesus is our Lord, 
then the question is, how must we then live? If Jesus is our Lord, how should we be living? Think about Jesus, the Son of God. Our Lord, our Savior, he willingly laid down his life for us. And why did he do this? Because he loves us. Reading from 1 John chapter 3. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. So then the question is, Jesus, our Lord, who willingly laid down his life for us because he loves us, what is the appropriate response on our part? Because if he's Lord, it should change the way that we live. And how do we respond to someone who lays down their life for us? I think we should love them in return. And I think we should love Jesus the way that he wants to be loved. Anybody familiar with Gary Chapman's five love languages? Do you know your love language? Come on, what are some of those love languages? Words of affirmation. Some of these words of affirmation persons. What else are you? What? Quality. Quality. Hey, people like time together. What other, what other love languages do we have in this room? Physical touch. Yeah, you like a hug. Gifts. Hey, I like to get good gifts. What else? There's one more. Acts of service. We like it when people serve. And of course, as you look at that study... There's ways that we like to receive love, but so often that's also the ways that we like to give love. But to take it to the next level, you want to learn to love people the way they like to be loved. What if we apply that to Jesus? Instead of just loving Jesus in the way that we maybe want to love him, why don't we love Jesus the way he wants to be loved? And he told us what that looks like. It's in John 14, 15. He says, if you love me, what will we do? Can I ask you what's Jesus' love language? What is it? Obedience. Obedience. If you love me, obey my commandments. It would do us well to start loving Jesus the way he wants to be loved, which is in obedience. I've shared on many occasions one of the challenges for us in the West is we have focused a lot of our energy on growing in knowledge about Jesus but not enough energy on learning to obey him, putting those things in practice. I'm reading through a book called uh, Miraculous Movements. It documents the move of God in Africa and other places. And the author talks about this difference of knowledge-based obedience or knowledge-based discipleship and obedience-based discipleship. Here's what he writes. It was an interesting insight. He said, Eve's sin was choosing knowledge over obedience. She wanted knowledge that she thought she could get by eating from this tree that she thought God was withholding from her instead of being obedient to what God had asked of, don't eat from that tree. But here's what the author says. And that same foolish choice plagues the modern church today. Lord, help us. May we not just grow in knowledge, but Lord, help us to grow in obedience. Lord, help us to love you the way that you want to be loved which is by obeying your commandments. Jesus didn't say, if you love me, you will learn my commandments. He said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And the interesting tension for us there is it's actually once we start to obey those commandments that we step into the life that God always had for us. I think we still struggle with that same tree thinking, If I start to do what God wants me to do, if I only listen to his voice, I'm going to miss out on something. That's a lie of the enemy in your life. Jesus leads us into life flourishing. That doesn't mean easy. It just means flourishing. And the question is, can we follow him there? Obedience is the doorway. So I want to encourage you, don't just hear from the Lord, but begin to obey that. Because it's, Not until we start to follow Jesus and obey what he says that we are transformed. Love Jesus how he wants to be loved by obeying his commandments. And the question is, what does Jesus expect of us? What are his commandments? When asked what commandments were the most important, here's what Jesus said. You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Loving God and loving others are the commandments we follow because Jesus is our Lord. If Jesus is our Lord, 
deserving of our love, we should obey his commandments and step into the flourishing life he has for us. And how do we fulfill that? How do we express our love of God in others? What does that look like? Well, Jesus tells us right before he ascends to heaven to the right hand of God. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus says, I have been given all authority in heaven. This is how Jesus says, you can do this. I have the authority and I'm interceding for you. So go and make disciples and baptize them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to do what? Hey, what if we put in there? Teach these new disciples to love me. Isn't that what he's saying there? Teach these new disciples to love me, which looks an awful lot like them obeying my commandments. And be sure of this. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. And that makes all the difference. You can't fulfill this request on your own. You need Jesus alive and well in your heart to make it happen. So here's as simple as I can make it for you this morning. If we love Jesus as Lord, we will love God, we will love each other, and we will love the lost. That's as simple as I can make it for you today. If we love Jesus as Lord, what does that look like? We love God. We'll spend time with him. We read that abide daily guide to say, oh Lord, more than I need anything else in life, I need you. And then we love each other. We don't allow personality conflicts to get in the way of what God wants to do in and through our lives. We invite each other over for dinner because it's fun to hang out with others. We pray with people who are going through hardship and we celebrate with them when they've got things to celebrate. And then we love the lost. We have a heart for the lost. We pray for our neighbors. We begin to know our neighbors' names and their kids' names. It starts with saying hello. Like, hey, I see you. That might be a good start. How are we doing? Loving God, loving each other, and loving the lost. It's really not complicated, but it is crazy how much we missed the mark on this one sometimes. Uh, from my experience, usually we might good at, be good at one of those, two, or three, you know, or, or two of those three, but it's, it's sometimes hard to be good at all three of those. Maybe we're great at loving God. I, I spend time in his presence, and then later that day, I, I hold a grudge against another believer. Well, that doesn't look like loving Jesus as Lord. Or maybe I'm great at loving believers. I, I have a great time spending time with them. I, you know, I volunteer and serve on teams with them, but then I, I don't really care a whole lot about the lost. I don't know any of my neighbor's names. I, I try to avoid my coworkers, eat lunch on my own. Or maybe you're great at loving the lost, but then you never take time in God's word or in prayer. Or you don't really love your fellow brother and sister very well. So my challenge for you this morning is to love Jesus as Lord by loving God, by loving each other, and by loving the lost. So how are you doing in those areas? How are you doing loving God? This is a good assessment time for you. How are you doing at loving other believers? When's the last time you had somebody over for dinner? How are you doing loving the lost? Are you talking to your neighbors? Do you offer to pray with them? Or share the good news of Jesus when opportunity provides. Because Jesus is Lord, it's important that we love God, love other believers, and love the lost. I encourage you, make Jesus Lord of your life. He gave his life for it. He gave his life for it. I was talking with uh, one of the, our church members at the end of the first service and talking about this tension that we're in of understanding we're called to be everyday disciple makers. We're also trying to figure out, oh Lord, and how do we do that well? My encouragement is, stay on the journey. We'll figure this out together. We've got wonderful things as we head into the next year, looking at what does it look like to love our neighbor? There's very practical things that that looks, looks like. But in the meantime, may I encourage you, just start by talking with your neighbors. People are lonely today, in case you haven't figured that out. People are isolated, more isolated today than any time in history. Greater access and network than ever before, but more lonely than they've ever been. And there's something in you that could change that in their lives. The question is, are you willing to have that conversation? So love God, love each other, and love the lost. 
How much fulfillment could you have in life knowing Jesus, your Lord, your intercessor, your deliverer, your rescuer is at work in your life? Jesus is working in your life right now. The Holy Spirit probably right now is prompting you to consider, okay, how do I apply this to my life right now? So I'm not just a hearer of the word, but a doer. It, we've talked many times at the back of your program on the, on the very bottom where you can take notes on the messages. The reason we're trying to help lead you this way is because transformation requires application. So the question for today is, what's on the bottom of your notes? In response to this message, I will what? I'm going to start to love God more by spending time with him on a daily basis. I'm going to start loving my fellow believer more. I'm going to grab somebody on a Sunday and invite him to lunch. I'm going to start loving the lost better simply by just getting to know the names of my neighbors. What is God speaking to you? How much peace could you confidently have knowing almighty Jesus is advocating for you? God wants wonderful things for your life, but you need to surrender your life to him as Lord to enter into that. I'm going to invite you to stand as we close in song this morning. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus as Lord. But today you would say, I want to know him like this, to understand that the life that I can step into in his name can change everything for me. So today you would say, I I haven't been following Jesus as Lord, but I want to know him this way. We always want to provide a space where you can make that decision on a Sunday morning. So with every head bowed in this room, if that's where you find yourself to, to say, you know what, I want to surrender my life to Jesus as Lord, knowing he grants me life and meaning and purpose in this life and life eternal forever with him and other believers. So today, if that's you and you'd say, I want to follow Jesus, I want to serve him as Lord, simply raise your hand and I'll pray with you before we leave today. Anybody would say, that's me. I want to make Jesus my Lord. Jesus, the son of David. Jesus, the son of God. Jesus, our Lord. Anybody say that, say, that's me. I want to I want to follow Jesus. I want to make him Lord of my life. Scripture's promise is if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And what that means is immediately, like you're saved from the life that you're currently in, but you're also saved for eternity with him. Anybody today that would say, that's me, I want to follow Jesus as Lord. God, I just pray right now, for each and every one in this room. I pray, Lord, that wherever we have struggled with your Lordship in our lives, that, Lord, we would struggle no longer. Set us free, Lord Jesus, that we might step into the life you have for us. Lord, may we live confidently every day in your name, knowing that you are with us. Lord, that where we fall short, you stand in and and rise up and make up the difference. And so, Jesus, I just pray that you would help us to live with you at the center, knowing, Lord, that you are enough. And so, God, I just pray if there are those in this room that have not surrendered their lives to you, they don't know you as Lord, I pray, Jesus, that you would continue to, to show them the way. Just as you revealed and have been revealing through the New Testament book of Luke, I pray, Lord, you reveal yourself to the hearts and lives of everyone in this room. Help them step into the extraordinary life that you offer. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to love you, to love each other, to love the lost. Help us do that well, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name.